Osmar Grüber. Welcome to the executive talk. We meet in your office in Zurich, so you still have an office, you're still very active, you're still working a lot, we still hear you and read about you a lot. Uh, didn't you ever think that, you know, you're, you're over 70 years old and, and, and you could be living the life of a retired man and just playing golf in Spain? Was that never interesting for you? No. <laughs> Why not? Because uh, markets and international markets and these days politics are more interesting than playing golf. You were, of course, retired once before when you left Credit Suisse and before yep. you, you kind of went as a fireman almost uh, to UBS as the CEO, you were a retired man. And, and people say back in those days, you were a bit bored as a retired man. Is that something that is in, in your character that you simply cannot leave the markets alone or you simply cannot do something else? Uh, I think this is mainly news reports. I never was bored. Okay. I'm <laughs> because I'm so much interested in what is going on and uh, I have my terminals which tell me in the whole of the world what is going on and uh, on, in the markets. And since I have a trading background, so that is still interesting to me because whatever the markets are doing, they tell you what people are thinking, what people are hoping for. And that is the interesting thing. So is it fair to say, when you say that, that it's, it's, it's almost like, I wouldn't say a drug, but once a trader, always a trader, that's not something you can just switch off and, and be interested in other things. That's something that still lives within you. I think so, yeah. That's why once a trader, always a trader, where it comes from. So one obviously has studied people <laughs> who once traded and uh, they're always interested in what is going on. And that's yeah. a funny thing, by the way, that, that uh, you, you say that because you, you once said also becoming a banker wasn't your, wasn't your childhood dream. I mean, someone from your family apparently said, uh, go into banking because that's where the money is. But you said, yeah. for example, you, you would have liked to be a journalist as well because you're interested in people. And was banking for you only interesting when you realized it is about reading people. It is about knowing the facts. It is about knowing what happens in politics as well as in the economy, as well as in, 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 in the society. So bringing all this together, was this what, what tempted you in banking? Eventually, when I then had to go to banking, which I didn't want to, <laughs> but uh, learned very quickly in a bank, and it was a Deutsche Bank at that time in Mannheim in Germany, where I learned banking and then later in Frankfurt, I discovered that as a banker, and especially when you're in the international business, the world is getting smaller and smaller. And before the world, if you're not a banker, the world was still very big. In these times, uh, people still traveled per ship to New York. And uh, <clears throat> later in London, we used the Concorde to go to New York and came the same day back. So that was the interesting thing, and to know uh, what is going on virtually immediately through price movements, uh, through political statements uh, which you get uh, through the systems you have. Uh, that tells you, I think, a little bit on where things will go, where you can make a better opinion of uh, where the future, the immediate future, where does it lead you? Mm -hmm. And since I'm a person who always likes to know what's coming next, uh, it's great. It's quite helpful in your job as well. But does that mean that you, you, you understand people and you understand maybe politics and maybe how things work a little bit better by knowing what you know and by having that background in, in, in the business world, in banking? Yes, I think so. Politics is, has a lot of, uh, to do with emotions and uh, astonishing, astonishingly very little with facts. But uh, look at Brexit at the moment. The pound went up and uh, because everybody in the market uh, would see finally a Brexit happening. And uh, <clears throat> before when it originally the vote came in, the pound went down because everybody said, oh, we don't know what the future will bring us. The famous and, uncertainty, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that, to also to study uh, mass psychology, how masses are 
acting at, uh, at a certain point and uh, on news. Uh, that is very interesting, especially today where you get news within seconds from everywhere in the world. It's, it's fantastic and uh, how people react to it and uh, what uh, huge decisions are made on uh, a news piece uh, in, which happens in one moment and uh, you would think, why don't people first think about it? No, they don't think about it. Uh, look at the energy policy in Germany, for example. Mm -hmm. They made billion hundreds of billions decisions on Fukushima, which today doesn't look so good. Mm -hmm. So I take from that that you, 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 well, you've always been quite critical uh, towards politicians, politics in general. Uh, you've also been quite critical and very outspoken uh, still uh, towards the industry and what happens in the industry. If we take a very kind of a, a current example, what happens to Credit Suisse, your former uh, employer, uh, what happened between, between Iqbal Khan and, and, and the CEO, uh, Tijan Tiam, uh, you were one of the first to kind of react to that and to be very clear and saying uh, spying in a, in a bank like this uh, isn't correct. If that happened, uh, Mr. Tia must have known about it. If he had known about it, he should be uh, fired. To be so clear about certain things, does that take courage or does it just take your, your kind of your, your natural that you say, I say things like they are or how I see them? No, I always felt very independent, and these days I'm more independent. Even more, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I wouldn't have said these things and couldn't have said it if I still were in employment with the company or whatever, then you don't do these things. But when uh, it is first uh, my judgment now from what a CEO should do within a company, and running a company of uh, 50,000 people is... Uh, <clears throat> all along and making it uh, profitable and running it successfully, you are first, uh, you're supposed to be very lonely, you can't have favorites within your company. You have to have a very clear character where you know what is right and what is wrong and uh, you also have to take responsibility what your employees are doing at any uh, given time. And uh, in a case like that, uh, you have to, and that was a specific case, which thanks God doesn't uh, happen all uh, day, uh, where you have uh, the CEO is getting in a fight with uh, one of his apparently best employees. Top employees, yes. And uh, which uh, leads to that employee having to leave the bank and uh, get special conditions to leave the bank sooner than uh, he otherwise would have. Then uh, <clears throat> the whole investigation starts and uh, which uh, <clears throat> Uh, begs the question, why does one do that? And uh, because if he was such a good employee and uh, he understood uh, the people, they will follow him anyway. And uh, so what uh, you're trying to achieve there. And then uh, the biggest problem is actually, when no, most people don't even talk about, even a person involved in the whole thing uh, killed himself. And uh, that is the story according to the chaos theory. It starts with a very little thing. The butterfly and, and, wings that, that causes And develops a, in yeah. something unbelievable. And uh, so, in the end, also his friend of 20 years and who he worked together for, for that time, uh, had to leave uh, the bank or was the one who was found guilty. And uh, these are stories which uh, not only sound unbelievable, but uh, as a CEO, I think uh, if you bring a story like that, 
you lose uh, credibility with your employees. And when you lose that, uh, you cannot be as successful anymore as you had been before. So, uh, in a nutshell, two people had to leave because of that affair, but Mr. Tiam didn't yes, leave. And, so he, he should one, have, he should have person, left as well. And one person died. And just think about that. It's incredible. What about the reputation? Because that's, uh, you know, we, we've, been, we've been in the news all over the world, the Swiss banking uh, sector, with that story, and some might say with that a little bit ridiculous story as well, because it started, as you said, as a, as a kind of, apparently, as a, as a fight between two men. Uh, does that bother you as well, that once again maybe Swiss banking has a reputation problem or that people might, uh, might talk badly about, about the job you, you, you kind of love? It became a reputational problem uh, for Switzerland again because uh, clearly business is business and uh, foreign banks would like to have uh, the assets the Swiss banks are having. So they and just so wait for these stories? Immediately the stories which came out uh, were to put that in the context of look at the Swiss, what they are trying to do again. And that harms our business because it's a serious business to look after other people's money. And you cannot uh, have stories like that uh, evolving and ending in, in, as in that case. Mm -hmm. Uh, something else you said in that case is that it would probably be better if, if, if the, the top banks, the two top banks in Switzerland, had Swiss CEOs and not someone coming from, from other countries. Why would you think this is so important? Is it because uh, only they could understand the Swiss banking? It was uh, the interviewer asked me the question of uh, if it was time to have a Swiss CEO again. And with the uh, Swiss banks now being much less international than they had been 10 years ago, because they mostly reduce their investment banking to a level where it isn't important anymore, I think uh, clearly um, that uh, Swiss CEOs uh, <coughs> and we also have, would have Swiss CEOs uh, with uh, international knowledge who could, uh, would probably present a lower risk uh, than uh, having uh, totally foreign CEOs uh, who have the image probably of the big world, but uh, that is not so necessary anymore as it probably was uh, 10 years ago or 20, 20 years ago. Speaking of that time, 10, 20 years ago, you, you said it yourself, banking has changed and Swiss banking has changed uh, also since the crisis, of course. Do you think if you were still CEO now, would your job look completely different than it did uh, back in the 90s, for example? Yes, absolutely, yes, because banks de-risked uh, enormously here in Switzerland and uh, say, say that all the risk before was clearly in investment banking and uh, Today, you, that's not any more important and uh, they're still trying to reduce risk and concentrating only on wealth management and uh, certainly in banking there is always some risk and uh, we are probably building up some risks uh, these days which we do not realize because we think it's riskless. Mm -hmm. but. That is mainly on the credit side, I'm seeing on the loan side. And, uh, <clears throat> but generally, uh, the job has changed to <clears throat> more, if, if I think back when I started in banking, banking was something like that. It was very little risk and uh, more, you had to know the rules and uh, you had to... Uh, <clears throat> be uh, more in offices than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that you might, you might talk about your, 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 your beginning in, in banks. I read somewhere that when you started, of course, there weren't any computers around in the 60s, you, you, you had to, to calculate a lot in your head. And, and I, I read that... Which was a good thing. Uh, of course, yeah. and you, you probably learned, <laughs> learned so much more. And, and even when computers came up, you probably 
had to kind of double check whether what the computer said was really? right and you're still really? doing the, the head count. Yeah. But yeah. if you think of these days and if you think how you developed, now you talk about screens as well and you're, 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 you arrived of course in, 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 in the technological present as well. Have you developed as a, as, as a banker with all these tools that you have at your, uh, at your disposal now as well? Or would you say I was a, as, as much a good as a banker in 1965 than I would be now? No, uh, it, uh, the technology helped us a lot. And uh, I actually, when I was in London in uh, 1980, we bought, uh, I insisted that we buy the first so-called fail-safe computer, which was nothing much than two computers, and one computer copied the other constantly. <laughs> and for several millions at, at the time, which was a million was a million still then. And uh, to be better in the business, to be able to do business around the world, we uh, <clears throat> went at telephone lines uh, around the globe to uh, be present in Asia and uh, New York and uh, everywhere. And uh, so I think technology expanded the business enormously and uh, also the profits uh, in the business. Mm -hmm. uh, change of subject, there's been so many rumors about you as an executive, as a boss, and I think it's time that we kind of clear these rumors or maybe, maybe deny them or confirm them. Uh, it's been written quite a lot that you have been a tough boss. Is it, is it true that maybe, uh, let's take some examples, that if someone came into your office, you wanted to know within 30 seconds what they wanted, if they couldn't present you quickly what they wanted, they had to go away again? Or is it true that if someone had a beard, they wouldn't get a, 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 a bigger remuneration? Or if someone had a light <laughs> suit, you ask them, are you on vacation? Why aren't you wearing a dark suit? Are all these stories there's true? There's always some stories are true, others not. Uh, I like to have a presentation. If somebody can't tell me within, not 30 seconds, but in a few minutes, that what it right. is about, yeah. then I have to question, does he know what it is about? And uh, is it a good business? If it is a good business, you don't need an hour to explain it. It becomes apparent in a few minutes. And uh, then, uh, yes, uh, I, because uh, the way I grew up in banking, uh, and yes, people have to be properly dressed, especially when they see clients. And uh, so they cannot, uh, come in a light suit or whatever, and banking, it has to be a dark suit and, yeah. and a tie. And uh, so, so these stories all came up. And uh, but would you agree that you have been a demanding boss? You have been a tough boss? I would think uh, of it more like a benevolent dictator. So, okay, but so which one is I, bigger, the benevolent <laughs> part or the dictator part? <laughs> uh, it, it's more, I would uh, I try to get out the best of people by challenging me. Saying, fine, if, if they uh, propose some things and I ask questions, and to test and if they, if they really believe in what they are trying to do, or um, if they haven't got a clue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, when you test people with questions with arguments, they have to have to answer. If they can't answer or have no good answer to the arguments you bring against what they just propose, then it can't be so good. How much of that is, is, is coming from your from your past or from your upbringing. I mean, you, you, haven't, you haven't been born with a silver spoon, uh, let's certainly, put it that way. Not, no. you, have been, <laughs> you have been born in the war, you've lost your parents in the war, you, 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 you flew from, from the GDR to, 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 the, to, to Germany as a, as a young child. I mean, it's fair to say that you didn't have it easy. Was this, was this important in, in the way you think now, or also as a boss or as an executive, that kind of straightforward, no BS uh, uh, attitude in a way that you always uh, said, uh, look, let's, let's say it how it is. I presume, so as you grow up in life, uh, that uh, does something with you and uh, you learn from it and uh, have certain experiences uh, which you, from whatever you learn from this experience, you can use in later life. And 
But uh, I think the biggest change, and uh, which uh, not everybody uh, realized in uh, the last few years, is uh, like uh, it started uh, 10, 12 years ago with the explosion of uh, the technology in our world was that nobody could lie anymore. And it took very long for people to realize that. Also for politicians and everybody in business. And as, as you know, suddenly all the lies are coming up and uh, getting presented because that's what technology did. And Speaking of lying, that's a, that's a tricky, tricky question or kind of a tricky transition because I wanted to talk about about uh, President Trump as well because you've you've met him uh, when when you were still in the U.S. and you even made made business with him and you once said something very interesting. You said he's an obnoxious man. I wouldn't want to spend time with him, but he does a lot of things right. So can you be can you be an unpleasant person and and be right at the same time? I said he did a lot of things right with the economy, mm -hmm. and uh, he still has done. And uh, look at America. He <clears throat> created a hell of a lot of jobs, and in all sectors and in minorities, uh, they all got new jobs, and uh, jobless uh, claims are at the low, and so on. So he did a tremendous job with the, U uh, with the US economy. But as a person, I, I would say he's not likable, no? When you met him, what, 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 what kind of impression did you have? What, what, what didn't you like? It is him, him, and only him. End of story. And would you like to talk to somebody who is only concerned about himself? And because it's difficult to talk with a person like that. I'm surprised that he still finds people who want to work with him. <laughs> when, you, when you take that example and, and take it to Switzerland, is that something that we're missing sometimes, that we're lacking maybe in a way that... Uh, a little bit probably. Yeah. A little bit. We are too polite. Okay. Too <laughs> polite. Maybe too modest sometimes as well. And uh, yeah, too modest, but that probably has to do with the religion we have here, that where modesty is the top thing. Mm -hmm. uh, would you say that looking into the future, uh, uh, the end of, the, of, of, of this discussion, uh, is that something that, that might be a problem for Switzerland? That we are too polite, maybe too kind of, kind of uh, risk averse in some, in some uh, ways? No, that... uh, no, no. Uh, I think uh, that's why everybody likes us. Mm -hmm. and so it can be an uh, asset, you say? Yeah, I think for Switzerland it definitely is an asset and uh, that's why everybody likes to come here and uh, that's why we get so many visitors as well. Mm -hmm. And we look, when we look even more into... And that's into... why I live here. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, and you've, you've been living here for a, for a long time. Uh, so that means you're not planning to kind of retire... Uh, Anywhere uh, else? Any, no. any, <laughs> any day soon to Spain. <laughs> and you still want to be an active... I mean, I, I, when we hear you talk as well, I have the impression you're, you're almost like a very, very active citizen nowadays. That you, you want to raise your voice if you think something is not right. Is that a role that you're... That you're comfortable with that no, you want no, to play? I don't see it as a role, but if somebody asks my opinion, I tell it. So that's the beautiful thing that you have now, after, after being, having been CEO of, of the two top banks in Switzerland, now you can tell things like they are? Uh, no, I don't see it like that. I have my opinion, and uh, so people probably only ask me because I was at some time in the past. CEO of the two banks, but uh, I see myself more as very independent. And uh, yeah, and I say what I believe in. Final question, if you look at that, uh, maybe at, at that apprentice who, who, who started work uh, in the Deutsche Bank, as we heard, not something he absolutely wished to do, was more or less forced to do. Uh, but if you look at your career, and if you think of that, that young man back then, in the 50s or in the 60s or even earlier, uh, what would that boy think of the career you did? And what would he think of the, of the, of the uh, soon 76-year-old uh, Oswald Grübel now? Oh, uh, did all right, I think. That's all? Yeah. <laughs> Oswald Grübel, thank you very much. <laughs> it was a pleasure.